Hello Chem Geeks! Today we're going to learn how to design a data table. So far what you've done is you've learned about scientific design and how to create your own experiment. You realize that we start off with a problem that you want to learn something more about. The next step is to do some observations and some research to learn more about the problem. Then you create a hypothesis and then experimentation begins. But to do a good experiment you have to collect data. And we want to collect data in a very organized way that you can easily interpret and analyze later. So how do you create a very good data table? Well, let's think back first to a demonstration you might have seen as a younger kid. It's the volcano explosion. Did you ever have a kit where you created your own volcano and it erupted with beautiful red lava? Well, let's recreate that right now. We have a very nice volcano, and inside of it, we've put some very simple things. We've put some vinegar and a little bit of red food coloring and maybe just a touch of soap. And what we're going to add to that is some baking soda, which is also called sodium bicarbonate. And what we're trying to do is create that lava effect. But what that really is, is carbon dioxide gas being created in a chemical reaction. So let's see if we can recreate that experiment from your childhood right now. I'm taking some baking soda and I'm going to pour it into the volcano. Can you feel the heat from the volcano exploding? Let's say you watched this demonstration and it piqued your interest in chemistry and you thought, wow, I wish I could create more lava. How could I do that? Well, you see, you've actually got a problem. And if you learned a little bit about chemistry through research and observations, you might learn that this is simply a chemical reaction between baking soda and vinegar. So now you create a hypothesis. If I add a larger mass of baking soda, then I will produce a larger volume of carbon dioxide gas. You're writing your hypothesis as an if-then statement, which is what we do in chemistry. So now it's time to collect data. How are you going to go about doing that? Well, remember, there's only one independent variable. You get to pick the independent variable, and what we had suggested was if we increase the number of grams of baking soda, more gas would be produced. How many different masses do you want to select? That's your choice. In your data table, you want to decide how many grams you're going to use in each trial. So we're going to talk about what the columns in your data table would look like and what the data looks like that you're going to collect. So we've created a pretty cool setup for our experiment. We've taken 20 milliliters of vinegar and we're going to place it in a small Erlenmeyer flask. In a weigh boat, we have 5 grams of baking soda. We're going to also place that in the Erlenmeyer flask and quickly stopper it. You'll notice the rubber stopper is connected to some tubing. The tubing is going to feed into a very large graduated cylinder that's been completely filled with water. The carbon dioxide gas is displacing the water, so when the bubbles stop, that means the chemical reaction is complete. When there's no more bubbles coming out, that's the time that we're going to measure the volume of carbon dioxide gas in the graduated cylinder. And that's the value that we're going to put in our data table. So we've put a lot of time into our experiment. We started off with a problem. We wanted a more explosive volcano. We wanted to produce more lava. So we did some observations and research and we found out that when baking soda reacts with vinegar, a chemical reaction produces carbon dioxide gas. So we then created a hypothesis. If we increase the mass of the baking soda, then a larger volume of carbon dioxide gas will be produced. And that's where the experimentation part comes in. We created a nice design 
where we could easily collect the gas that was produced from that chemical reaction in a large graduated cylinder. It's now time to figure out what different masses of baking soda we want to use and then we need to write down the volumes of carbon dioxide gas that we determined to be produced. From that data, we can make our conclusion. We can say, based on this data, if the hypothesis is true or false. So now we get to the point of the experiment where we have to collect data. We need a good data table. What do we want it to do for us? Well, a data table can do two things. A data table is something we need to record the results of the experiment and it's going to keep us organized because we want to analyze this data later. A data table has to be easy to read, understand, and interpret. Every data table needs to have similar components, so let's make sure we include all of them. The first thing you need is a title. The title should describe the variables being tested. In other words, we need to know what's the independent variable and what's the dependent variable. The size of the data table is determined by how much data you want to collect. So you have to think that through. How much data is enough? The independent variable will always be labeled with the correct units on the y-axis. So down this side of your data table. The units will be the unit of measurement. Um, things like milliliters, grams, pounds, meters. The dependent variable is the data that you're collecting and that's going to be labeled across the top, which we call the x-axis, and don't forget to include your units. So our title for this experiment is going to include the independent variable, which is the mass of the baking soda, and the dependent variable, which is the volume of gas that's going to be collected. For our data table on the y-axis, this is the independent variable. We're purposely changing the masses of baking soda that we're using. And over on the x-axis, we're going to label the volume of carbon dioxide gas collected, which is going to be in milliliters. Now you'll notice I've written trial 1, trial 2, and trial 3. That's because for each of these different masses of baking soda, we're going to run several trials. We're not going to assume that the first one was done perfectly. We want to run the same amount of baking soda three times so that eventually we can get an average volume. And we'll put that in the last column of the data table. So let's say we started off with five grams of baking soda. Okay. So we add our vinegar, and we always keep that constant. We always use 20 milliliters of vinegar in this experiment. And in the first trial, you can see we collected 245.1 milliliters of gas. In the second trial, uh, it changed ever so slightly. And in the third trial, it was also just a little bit different. But ultimately, what we want is this average volume. So what you want to think about now is what are the different masses of baking soda that I want to use. So in my experiment, I'm going to pick out some different masses. Um, you'll notice that I use 2.5. I want to see if I use half the amount of baking soda, am I ultimately going to find that half the volume of gas was used. And then the rest of these pieces of data, I pick some larger amounts of baking soda and I'll find out the volume of carbon dioxide for those. So once you collect the data, you're going to want to analyze it. And one of the ways that we do that is we create a graph. And we asked the question before of how much data should I collect? How much data is enough? Well, I wanted to point something out to you that, that could be an important factor to help you determine how many different measurements of the independent variable you want. Let's say we only use two different masses of baking soda. Okay, so there's our two data points. I want to make sure you understand that if you have two pieces of data, two dots, two data points will always create a straight line for you, no matter what. But in this experiment, let's pretend we collected several more. Let's say we collected 
data. And now when we go to graph it, we find out that the relationship is not quite the same. In fact, we get the swoopy upward curve instead of that nice straight curve that the two dots gave us. How about another option? Uh, going back to the two data points again, which we said would give us this beautiful straight line. What if I decided that I wanted to collect more data and this time the graph is going to look significantly different. In fact, it doesn't just go upward. First it goes down, then it goes upward. And remember, the purpose of the graph is to try to find out the relationship between the two variables. So we want to find out as the mass of the baking soda is increasing, what's going on with the volume of gas. And in this case, we find out as it begins to increase, the volume looked like it was actually going down, and then it made this turn around and it increased. Let's look at one more option. Again, let's say we're using only two data points. And two data points will always give us a nice straight line. And hypothetically, let's just say, if I were to do more data points than that, wow, looks like it's going up, looks like it's going up. Whoa, wait a second. It almost looks like I'm getting a plateau. So when I make my nice swoopy line here, it looks like it's going up, but now it actually plateaus off. So did this prove our hypothesis to be correct? Let's think about it. In the beginning, when the mass of the baking soda was increasing, we were seeing an increase in the volume of carbon dioxide gas. But at some point, that stops being true. In fact, it looks like we've maxed out on the volume of carbon dioxide gas that can be created, and it levels off here. So we've reached this maximum quantity. So there's a lot of components that you need to include in your data table. So this is a checklist for you. Go through this checklist and decide, did I do all of these things? If so, you've got a great data table. You should be able to analyze your results pretty easily. Did you include a title? Does the title have both the independent and dependent variable included? Is your independent variable shown on the, on the y-axis? Is your dependent variable shown on the x-axis? Did you include units for both of your variables? Did you do multiple trials so that you could average your data? And finally, as we just mentioned, did you collect enough data so that when you do your analysis, can you create a meaningful graph that allows you to interpret the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable? You've now successfully learned how to incorporate a data table into your scientific design.